Right. All right, folks, we are continuing our discussion of the desire satisfaction theory of happiness that is uh, found in Rush Shaped the Landau's The Fundamentals of Ethics. We were at up to this point where we will be discussing uh, some of the challenges that the critic would make to the desire satisfaction theory. Now, just to recall, we had said that if something is good for us, aka beneficial to our uh, well-being, that it's something that we desire or a desire fulfilled. We also said that the theory also makes this other claim. If it's something that we desire and that desire gets fulfilled, then it's good for us. That is, it will contribute to our well-being. Now, the method of critiquing this, even if it's not spelled out this simply, is all you have to do is find a case where G is the case, but not G, but, but not D is the case. Or vice versa, a case where a person gets their desire fulfilled, but they don't, they're not happy, they're not any well better off, and so forth. So, in other words, we're essentially going to be using which logical structure to deductively uh, try to refute it. Which deductive structure is at play again? Modus holens added again. If G, then D, but we find a case that not D, well, must be not G. That's sort of the method that's, that's at play here. Now, let's talk about some of the author's criticisms of the desire satisfaction theory. The first of these we've kind of already addressed a little bit. This is what the author calls the problem of false beliefs. And when we mean false beliefs, we mean false beliefs about what will in fact make you happy. Now this is where the author talks about the distinction between uh, informed versus uninformed desires. Now let's say that you end up thinking that you want something, you end up getting it, and it doesn't in fact make you better off. It would seem to contradict the desire satisfaction theory. Now this is the point at which the desire satisfaction theorists and this is something that Eatwood talks about, might end up modifying his theory in order to account for this problem. So instead of saying, if my desires are satisfied, instead you modify it to call them informed desires. Now, I don't have this one on the list, but let me give you one of the author's examples about a desire that, which I say, something that makes you happy, but you never desire it. A quintessential example of this one, this was a popular one on the homework, what the author called the pleasant surprises critique. Let's say that you didn't desire something at all, but nonetheless, when something transpired for you, it made you happy. This would be a case where you desire something, but it doesn't make you happy, or I should say, where something makes you happy, but you never desired it. Now take a guess what Heathwood would say. He would say, this is really a rather weak criticism. Because how the heck are you going to actually be expected to desire something if you have never even heard of it before? So this is why, let's say that I'll give you my easy example. Suppose that uh, you're going to watch some genre of a film that you've never watched before. So you don't know one thing or other about it, so you couldn't really desire to watch such a thing because you wouldn't really know anything about it but you experienced it, and you enjoyed it. In other words, it made you happy. Now, the reason why you couldn't have desired it ahead of time is because you didn't have any lust. You didn't have any information. And this is why people would say, this is a rather weak critique. Because the fact is, how could you be expected to desire something if you didn't know about it 
in the first place. The same way that you wouldn't desire to eat a certain kind of food if you didn't have any information about it. So once you know about it and desire it, then in fact you want it. So this is why Heathwood would say, this is a fairly weak critique. He would probably even say it might be setting up what we call a straw man, because it doesn't make sense to desire something that you've never even heard of. I'll give you another example. Now, if a, if a very young child, fresh young child who hasn't experienced much of the world is crying out in anguish, now, the child's the reason for crying is because of the discomfort caused by hunger. Now, the child who doesn't know what hunger is, of course, isn't going to desire food. And this is because the child's a blank or empty slate who doesn't even know what the concept of food is. All the child really desires is to have the pain alleviated. Of course, the child's not going to know in advance what's causing the discomfort. This is why someone like Heathwood would say, you know, this informed desires thing is actually probably a reasonable way and an allowable way to modify the theory. Does that make pretty good sense? Now, some of you talked about the cases where you, you didn't think that a compliment from some, some stranger would make you happy. That's the example of a pleasant surprise. Well, if you know in advance what a compliment is, it would actually make what? It would make sense that you would have some kind of joy after you get a, get a compliment. So this is why, why the informed desires critique would be what he would, would call probably a, a reasonable modification there and shouldn't be held against the theory. Now let's look at disappointment. Now, the author of the text brings up what specific example to try to express disappointment for you. The idea is if you desire something and you achieve it, you will therefore be happy according to this. He takes an example from the biography of tennis legend John McEnroe. What he desired more than anything else was to be at the top of his game, have respect from people, and all of the things that came along with you know, becoming at the top of your game. In other words, he had what? He had respect of his peers. He had fame slash notoriety. He was a household uh, name. Uh, uh, no, he was he was wealthy, but he wasn't what? He wasn't happy. This is what the author means by oh, I forgot about that one. That's what the author means by a case of disappointment. A case where you got your desires met, but it wasn't really good for your well-being. Therefore, fulfilling your desires must not be a key component to happiness, a.k.a. there must be more to happiness than just fulfilling your desires. Now, let me backtrack to the one I didn't talk about. It's the problem of what the author calls other regarding desires. Now, typically, when we think about our desires, we think of things that will enhance our well-being. Now, the critic would say, this account of happiness, desire satisfaction theory, wouldn't seem to, to be able to account for other regarding desires. And if that little uh, label for, for what we're talking about doesn't fully make sense, the author's talking about you're desiring something for other people that is not directly what? that doesn't seem to directly benefit you. Well, guess what? I would quickly harken back to some cases that Heathcliff was talking about. Nobody said that you can't have other directed desires. When people who I care about are better off, 
I get an internal feeling of well-being out of that. I happen to think that an expanded notion of desires and understanding our internal life could probably account for this pretty easily. Because not all of my desires are just about me. We have others within our sphere of concern whose well-being also matters too. Now, I guess that conversation probably leads us nicely to this ignorance of desire satisfaction. Now, what the author is getting at here, and Heath would also discuss this. Now, suppose that there is a case where you have a desire, either related to yourself or someone who you care about. Now, if indeed that desire is fulfilled, we would say that it would enhance your well-being. Now, the case that Heathwood gives is this. Suppose one of your relatives has to emigrate. And I forget what the exact details are. It doesn't matter. Now, you hope very much that Uncle Joe's life ends up going well. His well-being matters to you. The problem is you never watch. You never hear from Uncle Joe again, so you don't know how his life turned out. Well, it just so happens that in the world of facts, it is the case that Uncle Joe's life ended up going well. The problem is you didn't know one way or another whether his life went well or not. So your desire was satisfied, but guess what? You aren't any better off for it, because why? Because you didn't know the outcome. Now, your desire was satisfied, but you weren't any better off, because you didn't know about it. Do you think Heathwood would find this criticism convincing? No. He didn't find this criticism convincing at all. Because of course, if you didn't know about it, it couldn't affect your actual well-being one way or another. But if you had this knowledge about Uncle Joe's life having gone better, then it would improve your life. Now, what I'm talking about here is the need to perhaps refine this thing. And Heath would admit this. Your desire has to be met, but to some extent you have to what? Your desire has to be met, but you also have to know about it. So in other words, knowledge also would have to be a component here, according to him. Hope some of you remember that example. Now the question is, You'll notice what we've done in several of these cases. What have we done with the desire satisfaction theory? We have made modification to the theory. The question is, by making these modifications to the theory, have we irrevocably changed the character of it? Because remember, the initial version said, if you desire it and that desire is satisfied, you will therefore be better off. We have had to say things like, well, you also have to be aware of it. We've also said that your desires cannot be what? Cannot be entirely ridiculous or stupid. Because most of us know that some people have what kind of desires? Well, yeah, what we will call ill-informed, or in some cases, uh, was it self-destructive desires. Shall I go for the easy example? You've probably all seen what I like to call drug movies. Films about addicts, where the person who is an addict greatly desires to have his or her fix. Now granted, most of you wouldn't say what about the addict who gets his or her fix. You wouldn't say that that person is better off. 
Because most of you would say, that, I hope you would say, that feeding an addiction is really not good for anyone's long-term well-being. What is a good thing when it comes to an addiction? Yeah, freedom from it. Because in a way, being an addict is to be unfree, to not be autonomous. Now notice, folks, what I'm doing here by talking about what I'll call the easy example. We're starting to get at some of the criteria that a critic like the author would suggest are actually conducive to well-being, whether you what? Whether you desire them or not. Now, granted, Eatwood might say, yeah, this is a case where a person's desires really aren't good for them, but if they had been truly informed about things, they would want their life to go differently if they were truly informed. And keep in mind, simply because you have the inability to make your life go differently. Because if you've ever known someone who's an addict, on one hand, they want to do what? Yeah, they want to break the cycle of addiction. But simply because you want to break the cycle of addiction doesn't mean that you'll have an easy path to making it so. Because the short-term alleviation of pain ends up taking precedence over that long-term goal. As a matter of fact, when you're an addict, it's probably difficult to have long-term goals. I'm one of those fortunate people who has never been in that situation, but I have known more than a handful of people in such situations. But yeah, they actually have a desire to break the addiction, and most of us would call that an informed desire. And most of you would probably say, I don't know all of you, but, but some of you would probably say because your long-term health depends on it. And if you start to talk about your long-term health, you might be talking about what the author would call an intrinsic good, or what Hooker calls a non-instrumental good. Now, folks, I think that impoverished desires isn't all that difficult from difficult, all that different than some of the other things that we have already talked about. This is the idea that sometimes we want things that are not really conducive to our, to our good, are not really conducive to our well-being. Things like pursuing short-term you know, satisfaction over things like long-term satisfaction uh, might be an example of this. Now, if you had known otherwise, you would have pursued other things. If you had known otherwise, you would have pursued other things. Now, The paradox of self-harm and self-sacrifice. What does the author seem to be getting at here? In a way, folks, this was talking about some of the examples that you folks were hopefully going to know. Most of you did meaningfully think about in your homework. And this is, will actually help us to get ahead of things a little bit. This reading by Heathwood was the first of these readings that dropped the meaning bomb. And by that I mean is drop this concept of meaning on us to begin to think about in the context of what it means to live well. Now, I hope you figure it out, or you'll have figured out after my, my comments, that figuring out what constitutes a meaningful life might be easier said than done. As a matter of fact, thoroughly defining what a meaningful life isn't really something that I'm prepared or capable of doing. But the question was, 
Can you consider a case of a life that is beneficial to the person living it, but not meaningful? And as a counterpart to that, can you, can you find a specific case of a life that is meaningful to the person living it, but not beneficial? Now, ladies and gentlemen, from a desire satisfaction theorist standpoint, would he would say that living a meaningful life is necessary to living a good life or improving your well-being? He would would say no. As a matter of fact, guess what we can't even do? We can't even define what this thing, a meaningful life, is. Even though I think that most of you, based on your homework, think that there are certain lives that are, that are by their nature more conducive to a meaningful life or a life worth living. Many of you used examples of meaningful lives that were not beneficial as lives of self-sacrifice. Many of you said that lives of self-sacrifice whether it was doing charitable work that didn't benefit you in what way? Didn't benefit you financially. Or didn't benefit you in the sense that people would give you accolades for your good work. Now, folks, I would argue that if indeed it is something that you throw yourself into completely and you find purpose in doing it, in other words, if it's the kind of thing that gives you a reason to live, that might be another way of putting it, then I would argue that that life certainly does what for you. It benefits you. It's just that those benefits may not be tangible in terms of things like cash. Here's an example similar to one that some of you gave. The devoted mother who basically does everything, everything, everything for the well-being of her children to the point that she puts herself out and really has very little time or anything else for herself. That would seem to be a meaningful life, but not beneficial. Well, guess what? I would say that if she finds meaning in doing that, then it also benefits her even if people on the outside have difficulty seeing it. I think it's quite possible for people to sacrifice what most of us would call their happiness for the well-being of others. But I would say that it also benefits them. The same way that, uh, I don't know about you folks, but I guess this is going back about 10 years now. I was taking a jog with, with my dog, and it was, you know, late in the evening, and we were jogging through a parking lot. I found a bill box. It had several hundred dollars in it. Now, you do know what happens very frequently when people find bill folds filled with money. And then they toss the wallet somewhere. I'm not tooting my own horn here, but I unsurprisingly took the wallet home and I got in touch with the person who owned the wallet because I wanted to see to it that he got it back because it was a substantial pile of money. His ID was in there. If you've ever lost your ID, you know it's a pain in the butt to go through the process of getting new IDs and things of this nature. He was extremely thankful. Folks, if I had pocketed the money, I couldn't have done what? I could not have lived with myself. I would have liked to have a few extra hundred bones in my pocket. Who wouldn't? Because it certainly benefits you to have more cash. But what benefited me more? Yeah. It's called doing the right thing. In other words, my sense that I'm a decent person. 
And by also seeing the satisfaction on this guy, especially when I found out that he didn't have, I mean, it was pretty much all of his money for the month. In other words, it was a big deal to him. <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think it's quite possible to find meaning in things that might not be directly beneficial, but they certainly benefit me in other ways. Now, many of you talked about examples of beneficial lives, but not meaningful. These were uh, the most frequent answer, and this is no offense, because I think it's a good answer. The person who spends all of his life trying to do what? Yeah, spend his life trying to make money. And in some cases, you describe it as making money by any means necessary. In other words, being perfectly willing to throw anybody and everybody under the bus to get there. Many of you say, well, such a life would be beneficial, but not meaningful. Take a guess what Heathwood would say. He, he would say, well, who has the grounds to say that such a life isn't what? Is it meaningful for the person living that way? You may not be able to make sense of it, you know, living in your skin. But there are plenty of people out there who make the sole purpose of their life lives of achievement of some sort. They throw their lives wholeheartedly into some pursuit, whether it's money, whether it's academics, uh, whether it's, what is it, building sports cars, I mean, granted, I couldn't see myself doing a lot of those things. But who am I to what? Who am I to say that somebody else can't find meaning in such a life just because I can't? I'll give you, how about the author's example? Many people will put this on their objective list. And granted, I'm getting more expansive here. I'm getting a little ahead here. But many people will try to say that living a moral life is one of those things that is central to living a decent, meaningful life. Well, guess what? I mentioned this before, I'll mention it again. Heathwood mentions as one of his sort of cases when talking about the desire satisfaction theory, the disturbing case of Ted Bundy. And granted, I, I mean this in the, he was for the most part, a very successful American serial killer. I'm, I'm not praising him by saying a successful American serial killer. He got away with doing what he wanted to do for what? Yeah, for quite a while. Now, most of us would say living quite a life shouldn't do what? <clears throat> such a life shouldn't satisfy us. Why? Because such a life is doing the direct harm to other people. And that doing things that harm other people are not things that ought to be conducive to our well-being. Notice I use the word ought, ought not to be. Now folks, do keep in mind not to confuse what two areas of ethics. Do be sure not to too quickly confuse a discussion of value theory with a conversation about normativity. When we say that, when Heathwood says this, Ted Bunn even says this in the essay, when he says, it seems to me that Ted Bundy was happy while he was doing what? While he was satisfying his desires. And if he had never gotten caught, he would have continued to do so. Because indeed, that was what he wanted to do, that is what he was, what he enjoyed doing, and he it did indeed get 
satisfaction out of it. Now, most of us would say he would have been better off getting his satisfaction in other ways. Well, partly because he had, he had what most of us would call evil desires, like our discussion from, from the last uh, seven chapters. And most of us would say that evil desires harm other people. And because they harm other people, we ought not to take pleasure in them. Well, guess what? Some people do. That's just a fact. And this is why Heath would say, if Bundy had never gotten caught and he had continued, it would seem wrong-headed to say that he, for us to say he wasn't happy. Because if he could have continued, he would have continued to enjoy himself. And granted, I might be saying too much here. Most of us would not find such a life to be a meaningful life. However, guess what? There are people who find meaning doing absolutely abominable things. As a matter of fact, there are some, I don't want to go all Christopher Nolan on, on you here, but I happen to think that the Joker character in the Christopher Nolan film, uh, Batman and Dark Knight, looked like he was having what? He looked like he was having a jolly time. He looked like he was having fun. Super villains probably are at their happiest when they're doing what? Yeah, super villainy. When they're succeeding at. Just because they're not nice things doesn't mean that people can't find their bliss doing it. Now, the author of the text also talks about this issue of uh, our being happiest when we are satisfying what we call, he calls, our deepest desires. Now, folks, do keep in mind that the person who says, well, if he doesn't get happy doing it, if you're living a good life, then you will have pursued and achieved your deepest desires. He's lived a good life, therefore he's pursued his deepest and fulfilled his deepest desires. Now keep this in mind. Can we ever really be certain about what our deepest desires are? The desire satisfaction theorists would say probably not. And this is why this is also kind of a weak criticism from their standpoint. Well, the only reason why uh, I didn't get happy is because those weren't really my deepest desires. This comes back to the issue of being quote unquote informed. Now, we're good on time. Now, any last questions I can uh, answer about these chapters? Any last questions I can answer about the desire satisfaction theory of happiness? I do want to read something to you and make sure you've got the right idea since I didn't open up the text. Instead, I just talked about issues within it. I wanted to talk about this case about the, oh yeah, here it is. On page 33, I want to read it to you. This is also to make sure that you're engaged in a little bit of close reading. This is under the section where Heathwood talks about refining the desire theory. This is where he uses a fairly colorful thought experiment. He says, sometimes our desires are based on ignorance or confused thinking. That's true. When they are, it can seem doubtful that satisfying them benefits us. Thus, we have a potential problem for the desire theory of welfare. 
and probably for any subjective theory. Because once you say that there are informed desires versus uninformed desires, you seem to be implying that there are certain things that are objectively better for us and objectively worse. That's why he says it seems like it's a prior type would be a problem for any subjective theory. It says to take a simple example, suppose that I have a strong craving for cherry pie. Hope some of you remember this. What's the but the problem is, I have unknowingly developed a severe cherry allergy. So I greatly desire to, to eat this cherry pie that he's talking about. But unbeknownst to me, if I eat the cherry pie, it will severely mess me up. So if I satisfy my, if I satisfy my desire, I'll need a shot of adrenaline to avoid suffocating to death. Still in my ignorant state, cherry pie is what I want most. The desire theory of welfare seems to imply absurdly that it is in my it is most in my interest to have the cherry pie. Why? Because it's what? It's the thing that I desire the most. Even though what? Even though on one level I know it's what? Yeah, I know it's very bad for me. Now what case might this be a little bit like that I already went over? Thank you. Yeah, this might be a little bit like the case of the addict. Because on one level, most addicts know that feeding their addiction is not good for them. In other words, on some level, you know that if you continue with it, you will go further down the spiral. Now, admittedly, there might be a few people out there who feel how about going down the spiral? Cool! I'd like to live a tragic life. Well, most of us would say, what about this person? Yeah, crazy, uninformed doesn't understand the gravity of how awful it will feel. And I'll go, let's go you a step further. Most of us think that all things considered, a shorter life like that is not, and I hope I'm not triggering anyone, but most of us think that our cutting our life off like that is generally speaking not a good thing, not in our long-term self-interest. And take a guess what kind of people we might be forgetting about. There are some people out there who would say, better to burn out than to fade away. Right? You've heard that old phrase, better to burn out than to fade away. Now, of course, I couldn't likely find, and I hope you couldn't find any what in that what. Yeah, she's got it. Yeah, I was going to say meaning. I couldn't find any meaning in that. Well, take a guess with what Heath Wood would say. You're already supposing that such a person gives a rip about meaning. Because some people might not care about anything like living a meaningful life. As a matter of fact, and I would go on record saying this, this idea of living a meaningful life might actually be a luxury item. Does anyone follow what I'm talking about? The idea of living a meaningful life might actually be a philosophical luxury item. Because the fact is, in the past, you pretty much just had to think for yourself. This recent trend of wanting to find this thing called fulfillment might actually be a postmodern luxury item. The whole idea that you ought to pursue a line of work because why? Because it won't just provide me enough money to get by, it will also help me to fulfill myself. That's a luxury that, that my grandfather never had. That's a luxury that my father had more so than my more so than my grandfather did. And I hope that my children haven't. Oh, actually, I would say I I've had that luxury. I didn't have to go to work in the mines at age 13. 
you know what life was like for teenagers, even in the USA, 150 years ago. Going to work very young, doing something you probably didn't want. Yeah, spending 10 hours a day doing something you didn't even care about. Only to get black lung and, and die relatively young. Of course, you can think of this in many other occupations. But in a life like that, meaning isn't even, it isn't even on the list. At that point, you're just trying to get by and hope you don't get killed. And probably get a decent night of sleep from time to time. So you can go back and what? Get up and do it again. So perhaps even these conversations about meaning presuppose a whole lot historically and, and culturally and so forth. But anywho. Now these next two chapters are greatly related to what we've been discussing all along in value theory. These next two readings are really like a culmination of this unit. The first one is, excuse me, uh, by Brad Hooker. Uh, it's called The Elements of Well-Being. And I just wanted to uh, talk about the main ideas here, and then we'll talk about more on, at our next meeting. meeting. At the beginning of this essay, Hooker will lay out the problem. And really, this problem has kind of been with us in the hedonism chapter as well as the desire satisfaction theory chapter. I hope you're not tired of it yet. If you are tired of it, well, we'll be moving on to normative theory very shortly. The question is are there any non instrumental criteria of well being as objectivists contend? Now, non instrumental is the phrase he uses. This is essentially the same thing as what? What we were calling intrinsic goods. Things that are good for happiness in and of themselves, independently of what an uninformed person might believe. Are there any things that are non-instrumental goods? Then he will address a number of candidate criteria and he will assess them. Now, so many of these we've already discussed. The first one that he does discusses is hedonism. Now, we've talked about this extensively already, and just to reiterate, hedonism says that happiness is to live a pleasant life. Pleasure is a good thing. Pain is a bad thing. We're better off if we can achieve a pleasant life. Now, he does explain succinctly what are a couple of the old criticisms we already discussed about hedonism. Even if hedonism seems to be onto something, there do seem to be at least two contradictions here. <clears throat> a person can be happy according to hedonism, even if they are not really informed of what's going on. In other words, they might feel good from the inside, as he puts it, because it's all about your how you feel about your condition internally. A person might be happy on the inside, but be entirely deluded, objectively speaking, about their situation. And I've talked about this example in several contexts. The person who believes that he's that he's had a good, awesome marriage and family life. And he goes through his entire life internally thinking that his life has been good. But the objective reality is that none of what he believes is true. We would think that such a person, even though they thought themselves happy, would not truly be happy if what? If they understand, yeah, if they knew, if they understand reality. And this is part, part of why some of us would say, it can't be just about how you feel internally. The way you feel ought to somehow 
relay meaningfully to how things really are. He also reiterates the desire satisfaction theory, what he calls the desire fulfillment account. <clears throat> he says that one strength that the desire satisfaction theory has over hedonism is that it accounts for an individual being able to have fulfillment that is not related to pleasure. Because keep in mind, for the person who does not enjoy your garden variety pleasure, they might have very different desires. And fulfilling those very different non-pleasant desires might nonetheless, no, not might, but would still make that person happy. Like the person who desires to do everything for others, but ends up suffering internally and materially in the process, we can still define such a person as being happy, given that that's how that person defines happiness. However, a major weakness is that similarly we must accept what Hooker refers to as wacky desires being fulfilled as a sort of happiness. Yeah, he uses that phrase. He calls them wacky desires. Just think about the person who desires to live a life of just continuously counting blades of grass. Most of you would not find that life to be very what? Yeah, it would not make you happy, but guess what? There are some people who we would probably call odd ducks who find satisfaction in such things. Just like I would find it difficult to sit at a television all day watching Fox News 24-7 or, or pick whatever you wouldn't like to watch 24-7. Well, guess what? There are people unlike you who can get satisfaction out of doing things that you would find to be completely absurd and, and wacky. Now, we will pick up with this next time. Uh, he talks about objective list theories of happiness, and most of this we've already talked about to some extent. We will pick up with this next time in detail, and then we will go through uh, the elements of Susan Wolf's essay, where she discusses me. Cheers.